Welcome to Happy Times and Places, in which I, Toby Haydock, try to see if I can guess what my special guest's favourite things about their chosen episode of Doctor Who are. Hello, Toby. My name's Alex Moore, and I work in locations for both TV and film. You might have seen me on Phantom Films' online events, presenting, amongst other things, Doctor Who's Unsung Heroes. But if that doesn't mean anything, you can find me on Twitter at AlexMoore99. The story that I have chosen is The Time Monster, because in all honesty, I've not watched it in ages, and I managed to talk my non hooven partner into watching it recently, so that's always a good start. Ricardo Montalban's Dubious Undercrackers. An odd way to start, I know, but I, I've just edited a few of these, and every single one of them, before I start, I go, OK, so, and then the name of the episode. And uh, I don't want to be the OK, so guy. <laughs> That's just, the most, <laughs> I need to do this with a certain elan, or even a random concoction of words. And uh, R- Ricardo Montalban's Dubious Undercrackers, have the dubious distinction of being the first of those it's probably something i won't keep up it'll be as short-lived as the tardis interior in our first episode uh of this new regime of phraseology uh oh i've already bored myself hello we're going to do episode one of the time monster press play now I always do that press play now. <laughs> That's either. And I've done it different ways. I've had it on pause and started. That one I thought I'd enter select on play all because this is episode one. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very good at that bit either. <laughs> There's lots of bits I'm not going to. So it's the time monster. Um, uh, I've, I've got a new camera set up as well for those of you watching the video. Hello. Uh, If you're listening to this as a podcast, there is a video version available as well. Now, the time monster. I've done no... Ah, the stock footage that has also been in Enemy of the World and Inferno. Uh, It's it's like a semi-regular member of the cast. I remember that I think when they were cleaning this up, this particular sequence, I think, was supposed to be... It's beautifully shot, that. It's, It's a great way to open the story and i love that high angle and low angle stuff that's gorgeous but apparently this was an absolute dog's dinner to uh clear up but that's a that's a that's a great opening for a story that when i was young nobody really talked about much you know the pertwee era was you know the ones that were target books which this wasn't um uh, and then when people wrote up the Target Era, the, the, the Pertwee Era, the Pertwee Era had no bad stories. Uh, this was the official history. Uh, and then you were allowed to be a bit rude about Invasion of the Dinosaurs because even the producer said the dinosaurs weren't very good. Um, and I remember, yeah, I, I'm sure even that, there was a Doctor Who magazine article relatively late in the day that was top 10 turkeys. And it even said under Invasion of the Dinosaurs, Pertwee Era doesn't have any really any bad stories. And then you were allowed to say the Ambassadors of Death contradicted itself in the last episode, having set things up in the first. I'm not sure it's entirely true or any more so than any other Doctor Who stories. But Ambassadors of Death was allowed to be seen as a bit of a mess. It's one of the last stories I saw. I can't wait till we do that. I'll just be hopping about with joy. But I don't... I have to say the Time Monster is... And, and, and so the Time Monster I, I, I watched quite late, having been a bit underwhelmed by the Pertwee era because a, a lot of the stories had let me down from my imagination of what they would be because of the Target novels. But because I didn't really know much about this as a story, I had read the novel, but it wasn't a sort of childhood one because it came out quite late. So it wasn't embedded as, as perhaps some of the others. I remember when I, I watched it for the first time, I absolutely loved it. Um... And then when Rob and I did it for Running Through Corridors, which is a book that is available on the internet from Mad Norwegian Press, where we had to, Rob Shearman and I had to accentuate the positive. Uh, 
missed opportunity for me with the Crystal of Kronos. I must bring that. Um, Rob and I uh, did it and, and struggled. Rob particularly hated episode five. So this is going to be really interesting. It's it's fascinating that this is the one that Alex has chosen. And that's that's been lovely about this, is that people have their different reasons for choosing different stories. Alex is, is showing this to his non- Doctor Who fan partner. I think that's a test of a relationship. Although I, I do have a friend who's made his partner and his children and his children watch recons. I'm not sure I'm not sure what social services would have to say about that. Um so So I know the time monster is not well loved, but it's also not sort of often talked about uh, and so yes so we have Ruth is the feminist uh, Stuart Hyde is the comedy character I remember he has a line in the book where somebody calls somebody nutty and he says fruitcake standard and I remember thinking that was the funniest thing in the world uh, although people I know don't like Stuart Hyde who is played by Omega off of Ark of Infinity Ian Collier uh, who's whose voice got a lot deeper later on or he used oh no he's got he's got a good voice he's just putting on a silly character thing but he he has excellent um voice in collier no longer with us sadly um i I must stop saying that (laughs) we're watching programs that are 50 years old uh when i was younger when i was 15 you could say oh he's no longer with us it would be seen you know but I still do it. I watched this, the Lon Chaney Phantom of the Opera the other day. Oh, it was sad to see how many of the cast had gone from that film from the silent era, you know. Um, so, um, right, the Crystal of Kronos. I got once got talking to a man on a train. Doctor Who follows me around. Or perhaps I'm just flattering myself and I'm just cognizant of it. Or perhaps I just don't do anything else other than talk to people about Doctor Who. Um and, and I got talking to a man with white hair and a beard, and he—I think I was watching the Curse of Fenric, or I had it—I had the DVD out because you know I was watching DVDs on the train, as you can do these days, or could then. Um, this is about ten years ago, no longer than that. And um, and he said, uh, "Oh, I've, I'm Doctor Who," and he said, "I've got the Crystal of Kronos." I think. His dad worked at the BBC or something like that, and they were chucking it out, and he'd got it. Now, why didn't I get his name and address? We could have at least used it in the backdrop here. And what annoyed me was I then didn't mention it in the commentary we did for this. So then I mentioned it in the commentary for the arc, as if as if the range needed me to make up for that that oversight of mine. So I plonked it in somewhere completely unnecessary. Whereas I should have waited for a project like this to come along where I could mop up anything that I've left out. Um... So anyway, the Crystal of Kronos is out there somewhere in a man's garage. I should have put in an offer, shouldn't I? Um, It's amazing how things you don't realise until it's too late, some things, even though they're staring you in the face or, you know, speaking to you in plain English. Um, I I suppose people people don't like the sort of coziness by this stage do they i believe episode four i mean it's relatively short-lived i know but episode four is the last episode isn't it with the the unit family so benton yates brigadier joe doctor master Uh, i think episode four is the last one where they all appear together um so you know that that sort of that 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 part of this era is losing its iron grip but also some would say is getting too cozy i'm going to examine that as i as i say i don't i don't know this story as well as i might in fact the last time i saw it it will have been for running through corridors in what so what was that 2009 because i think i did the commentary for this prior to that can't remember I'll look it up on one of the future episodes. I'm not looking things up. I'm deter. I will for some, but to be honest, oh Benton and Civis. Um, oh, oh poor old Benton. I'm, is that legal? 
Couldn't he, couldn't he appeal to his union rep and go, look, I've got 48 hours off. Uh, John Wise as Dr. Percival. He appeared on a list of equity send out a thing every now and again going, we don't know where these actors are. So I dropped them a line and said, I think he's, he's, you won't be finding him. He's, he's, he's no longer with us. Uh, it's amazing how people drop off the radar. I mean, some of the people on that list, I mean, John Chalice was on it. Lily Cole was on it. I mean, they don't look very hard. It's just computer says, um, you know, so some people have died. Some people have, are no longer members of the union, about which I would have much to say, but for another day. I'm a union man, even though the union sometimes lets us down. I think we are stronger as a union and you can't claim a tea break. Oh, he's so good, isn't he? Although he's no longer... It's true, he does start speaking in a Greek accent and then doesn't bother. I don't care, he's so good. And he's got such a brilliant face, hasn't he? Knows exactly how to do it. Does he have to try again with Dr Percival? I think he does, doesn't he? Oh, no, he doesn't. I wonder what made me think he didn't. No, because he actually says you're a very... You're a very easy subject. And that, the master's theme. Hooray for the master's theme. Um, so, what do we know about the time? Well, because it's interesting, is it? It's credited to Robert Sloman... And, and it's a sort of attempt to recapture the... Glo- the, the demons were so popular. Mixture of, you know, uh, ancient history. Uh, Atlantis, even, which is mentioned in the demons and then contradicted here. Uh, very uh, unnecessarily quickly. Um, written by Robert Sloman and Barry Letts, although Barry Letts is now... Not to even... He didn't take a credit for the demons, but that went out under a pseudonym. Guy Leopold, the was it the 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 the, the father's names the father is Barry Leopold Letts wasn't he but I think Leopold was maybe his dad's name, um, so yeah Guy Leopold is father's names of the writers, or something like that, um, and uh, but now he just gives it to Roberts gives the credit to Robert Sloman. But he was quite. He's, I mean, he's, yeah, it's interesting. We don't sort of think of we think of Barry Letts as the producer with the the All Seeing Eye, but he wrote a lot of the key texts of the Poet Era and also directed them as well. He directed a story a year, which, so he has more sort of hands on involvement in that sense than any other producer until the modern era. You know, the producer writing and director. I mean, the modern showrunner writes more episodes but doesn't direct any. Uh, I was only just really thought of that. Isn't Katie Manning great? But I remember there's a picture of Joe and the Doctor doing this bit, I think, in uh, Doctor Who A Celebration. I remember thinking Joe didn't look anything like Joe, but she, she does. Her hair seems a bit straighter in that particular picture. Um, but yeah, this is a sort of attempt to recapture the uh, the glories of the demons. Uh, but I don't think anybody loves loves this as much as the demons. It's difficult to establish why when you're talking all the way through it, but that's what I have to do. I I remember actually watching this as a as a teenager, being amused by how you could double entendre your way through uh, the time monster. I think. I think he later dances around saying, we've done it, doesn't he? We've done it, we've done it, we've done it. And everyone's talking about come Kronos. Um, when I was a young man, that was hilarious. Um, I, I, th- <laughs> I don't know how far my sense of humour. My sense of humour has travelled slightly further up the belly button since then. Now, if you're up a ladder and played by Terry Walsh, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> the eagle-eyed will just go, well, he's going to fall off that. Um But, you know, this, this, it's, it's, it's odd. Ruth and 
Stuart are sort of quite self-consciously charactered characters, but quite often in the Pertwee era, the, the supporting cast don't. Uh, I would say, oh, I could. Could I just see a boom then? Um, <laughs> I've got a bit of boom in this, um, but they've self-consciously gone for. Um, yes, the feminist Wanda Moore uh, as Ruth and uh, Stuart Hyde, the the wacky scientist comedy guy. I loved Stuart Hyde when I was younger. I know people don't like him now. Let's see what I make of him. If I let him get a word in edgeways. Um, and Doctor Who doing time which it doesn't all that often i've sort of contended a few times that um you know that the moffat era you know makes doctor who about time and timey wime and all that sort of thing but in the in the original iteration of the show time travel got you to the story and got you out of the story but you didn't mess around with it otherwise because it raises too many questions and causes too many heads to get scratched i, I love that that set, Dr. Percival's office with the master. Oh, that reminds me. Quite often I get to the end of an episode and uh, I've, I've forgotten the thing I liked about it. So, ooh, uh, I, uh, I've, I've brought a pen and paper because quite often I've gone, oh, I, I like that bit. And then at the end I've, I've just grasped it at a straw because I can't remember. Um, yeah, Terry Walsh. Yeah, they've moved a vase. So yeah, I've not. Um, I've just sort of thrown this on blind because. Do you, do you want to know why? Because I've been working today and I'm a bit knackered. This was on my to-do list. Yeah, Terry Walsh falling off a ladder. Look at that. It was a good idea to get the sort of stunt men, the stunt team, uh, involved in the show. It does give it does give a few sort of nice set piece moments. Um, we've done it. We've. we've Done it. Oh, and the incidental music joins in. <laughs> oh dear! And then we get a comedy hand to the head from Stuart. Oh, I like the doctor's de device that he's holding there. Um, yeah, that's the picture in the Doctor's celebration. Um, something like that. Um, yeah. So I, I'm doing this because, well, because to be honest, because we're in a. Um, I've been working all day. We're, we're in a time of plague. Everyone's horrible to each other on the internet. The world's going mad. Uh, I'm not allowed to drink anymore. Um, and so I thought I'd just try and do something positive. Uh, I'm not my sister's keeper. I do like Stuart Hyde. Uh, yes, he suggested. He's taken the blame. He's not, he's, he's not totally cowardly. Oh, no, the master... No, he's got his Greek accent again. He doesn't speak Greek to Dr. Percival because he knows he's going to hypnotise him. Yeah, no, it's fine. He knows he's going to hypnotise Dr. Percival so he doesn't need to put on the Greek accent because that's quite tiring. Um, Wonder more who plays Ruth, We've, we we never found she was around. I had an Artists and Agents yearbook that a friend of mine got from a a bric-a-brac, you know, car boot sale or something and let me have. And it had certain agents listed and, certain, and, and, and whoever they represented. So I wrote to a few actors that were in that book, like Richard Shaw, um, who's in Quatermass Experiment, and, and, and a few others. But it was just pot luck that those agents, you know, were in that book and those actors were... Were listed and Wanda Moore was on it and I never wrote to her but I think I did give the address to a friend of mine and I think he did I've got a feeling he got a reply but by the time we were doing the commentary we, we couldn't find her we think she might have gone to America she was married to the guy from the war games who you know when Jamie and Carstairs are blowing over this blowing open the safe and he comes in and goes oh hello um, and they have to sort of um, distract him and eventually they, they tie up. Well, go bye then. And then he comes back and they have to tie him up. David Valor. She was married to him at one point, but um, there was something about America, but then I've 
got a feeling that might have been a different one. Anyway, whatever it was. I, do you live next door to Wondermore? Because this sometimes happens. I've probably been on a train with her. She was probably in the next carriage to the guy who's got the crystal of Kronos. Because sometimes it happens where you go, oh, we were looking for that person. And somebody goes, oh, I know where they are. Um, happened with us with the Reign of Terror when we had Tim Coombe on the commentary. And we, we, he knew we were getting people in. He knew that we'd got the actor who plays Soldier in episode six, Patrick Marley, because we knew he was still about. Uh, and then Tim Coombe goes, oh, yeah, Napoleon there. Napoleon, you know, big part. That's oh, Tony Wall. Yeah, I'm still in touch with Tony. And you go, well, what? Why didn't you tell us before we're doing the country right now? Um, so me and John Kelly actually went to Tony Wall's house later and recorded something um, for posterity. Um, but um, so, yeah, is, is Wonder Moore your mum? Uh, write to me at this address uh, because uh, she could do with being interviewed. Um, She, it's, it's, and it's a it's a it's a it's a good it's a good supporting part uh, the, that now that's a great great gap that the the master gets away from greeting unit and doing all of that because he pretends he's a lifelong pacifist that's a nice gag i do like that's neville barber isn't it and barry ashton um uh I'll talk about Neville Barber in the next episode. Barry Ashton, who plays his assistant, uh, he gets... Oh, I've already, he's already done a Happy Times Places because he's the Doctor's Hand and a policeman in Evil of the Daleks, episode two. Uh, and he's Ray Lunnan's sort of um, aide-de-camp junior officer in, in Frontier in Space. Uh, but he's also in... Uh, he's in the Moon Base. He gets killed on the moon with Victor Pemberton so he, he specialised in sort of he's a Welsh Welsh actor Barry Ashton specialised in small parts um, no longer with us I believe um, we, um, that is quite a phallic device isn't it I mean it yes you don't need to be, me to explain which bits of it are shaped like cock and balls? Because it's shaped like... Because it is. Um, now, now, sometimes you can spend so much time working on something and only afterwards go, that looks like a cock and balls. Does it? I mean, I've never done it specifically with, with the cock and balls. But um, I don't think I have anyway. But it's only when somebody else looks at your work that something... Or, or that you do it, or usually when it's an obituary I've done and it's been published. So only I've read it a hundred times. So, as soon as you see it in print, you suddenly go, "No, no, that bit's wrong. That was just a placeholder sentence that my my brain skipped over and went, that's just a placeholder sentence.'" And I assume they're going, "Well, we've got the thing going around, we've got the dials, and we've got the colours right, and yeah, there we go." And then he saw it on the screen and went, it's "Cock and balls, isn't it?" Uh, why did did nobody think to say when we handed it in, when we showed you the blueprints? Could would it have killed anybody to say, why is the doctor's machine a cock and balls? Um, I've got a bit south of the belly button. Tom. Uh, oh, so you've got a cock and you've got Tom Tit. I do hope they weren't throwing two blonde tondras and rude ones in. I actually like the fact that Doctor Who is clean. I like the fact that Doctor Who doesn't have innuendo or swearing or sort of adults doing smuggling a bit of filth in there to amuse themselves because I think you then lose sight of the, the main job I think it's good to have maybe political barbs and stuff like that um, perhaps because I've got double standards it's okay to do the sort of humour you like Toby but not, not the other one uh, maybe maybe I'm not saying I'm perfect oh you were ahead of me you knew that um, I, I hated the way I did that but it's too late now um Oh, a Farago of unsighted. I like the word Farago. Uh, oh, yes, and ben, ben, Benton knows that it's through the crack between now and now. Brilliant. I, I Benton has some good moments in this story, uh, which reminds me about... I'll tell you about the commentary, perhaps, when we get to a later episode, when I'm floundering. Uh, so, at the yeah, Benton's crack between now and now. Uh 
I've got I've got to choose decent moments. I've, as I said, uh, because of absorption of inertia. Uh, I like the fact. Yeah, it's 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 working again, says Joe. Of the thing she's holding in her hands. Oh dear, I'm not. That's not my sense of humour. I'm not a. I'm not a. I'm not a filthy cove. Um. I, 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 there's a cup and saucer there. I, I, Neville Barber arrived with a bowler hat. I like all of that sort of, uh, you know, stereotypical British iconography. Uh, you know, the, not be, 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 because the the juxtaposition of the the, the outlandish and, and the and the crazy against that sort of. That sort of stuff, I think, is more fun. The crystal is a very nice prop, and the way that it is lit, I think, looks very good. Um, I think I, I think we're about to have a cliffhanger where you don't where you don't actually know what's going on. Um, yeah, come, Kronos, come, ha ha ha. Um, I, I I like the fact Roger Delgado gets second billing. I I don't like the fact he's called Master. I think it should be the Master. Um, <laughs> I'm such a pathetic person, uh, but I do like the fact the Master gets second billing. That's that's really interesting uh, to, to 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 me. And Barry Letts told me that uh, the reason that the writer got written by at the end credits is because if people tuned in late, they never knew who wrote it. So that was that was something that that, that Barry did um, uh, that is unusual because normally the writer just gets gets credited at the beginning. Um, OK, so that's the Time Monster episode one. I'm going to have to press pause with the right remote control directed by Paul Bernard. Ah, which reminds it. Yeah, well, I think... I'm going to choose uh, that. Uh, 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 I like Benton's now and now, um, and various. But I'm going to choose that opening sequence. I think that to start the story, the uh, uh, nice uh, returning g g guest actor in the in the, in the form of the stock footage from <laughs> Enemy of the World and Inferno. But I love the the high angles and the low angles uh, and all that smoke. It was just a it was a very nice film sequence at the top that promised something we don't know what. Um, so that's what I've chosen. What has Alex Moore, my friend, chosen for his reason that he likes the Time Monster episode one? My best thing about episode one has to be the opening sequence of the Doctor's Nightmare. I mean, what a great way to start the story, and it looks so wonderfully gothic. One to me, because I guessed what he guessed. Uh, so, opening time monster. Best bits. Episode one, opening scene. Tick. Uh, right. Well, that was episode one of the time monster. I hope you liked it. I hope you're happy. I hope this is all right. Um, it's just something I'm doing in lockdown. I uh, hope it's entertaining. Uh, there's not, I can't do much. So, uh, but I can, I enjoy watching Doc 2 and I enjoy talking about it. So if you enjoy listening to this, hurrah, what a symbiotic relationship we have. If not, I'm just howling at the moon. Until next time. Ow! Can't believe I did that. Thank you so much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which was presented by me, Toby Haydock, and featured my special guest, Alex Moore, who is on Twitter at Alex Moore, E on the end, 99. Alex Moore, 99. As I say, thanks to him and to my patrons. My featured patrons this episode are Ruben Herfendahl, Rob Leonard, Jenny at Blue Box 99, Paul Cook, John Deere, Chris Dunford Kelk, Siobhan Galichon, Ian Key, Joe Llewellyn, Darren McKay, Stephen Moffat, Richard Straw, Luke Atkins, Peter Adamson, Will Brooks, and Richard Byatt. Thanks to them, and to Dave Gates, who composed the theme, Dylan Patterson, who did the artwork, and Gav Rymill, who did the YouTube thumbnails. <laughs> 
You have YouTube thumbnails, Toby. Yes, on my YouTube channel, you can watch this podcast if you so desire. And please do subscribe to that channel. And you can support these podcasts at patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke or ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydoke. And I'd really appreciate it if you could leave lovely reviews and five star ratings wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you ever so much.